video for our Math 1431 Calc Calculus 1 course. This is material on the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, section 6.2. Um, <clears throat> and so this material really deals with trying to evaluate the definite integral of a function Um, but now we're going to do it without using rectangles. So really, in section 6.1, what we were really going for was the definition of this actual signed area is a limit of rectangle area. And now we're going to come up with this sneaky way of evaluating this signed area without ever mentioning rectangles or chops or anything like that. So. What I want to point out is um, the result that lets us do this is what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And you'll see, as is common in most calculus textbooks, there's actually two versions or two parts to this theorem. There's a theorem part one and a theorem part two. And Technically speaking, it's part two that sort of lets us, um, part two or and part one, that, that really lets us, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, evaluate this definite integral. But part one is really close to part two. They're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. So I just want to prepare us in the beginning of these notes for the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, this first part, that's what we'll, um, this uses a new idea, and I'll even call it a weird idea, of um, creating a new function um, I'll call the, the new function capital F by keeping track of the signed area of an old function, maybe little f. So this is a big new idea, and once you practice it a couple times, you should get comfortable with it, even though it is kind of strange. So that's where I'd like to start these notes is talking about how if you give me a function I might call little f, I might create a new function that I would want to call an area accumulation function. I don't think our textbook or notes uses this phrase, but it is a handy phrase. Feel free to Google it. Other textbooks use this too. And so here's what I'm going to define it to be. I'm going to say my new function, which I'm going to denote, it's new by using a capital letter. My new function is capital F of X is going to be add up the signed area under my old function F from a starting point to a stopping point, which we would normally call B, but now I'm going to say stop at the place X. So this is what makes it a function of the input X, is my new area accumulation function of little x is add up, sum up from A and stop at X of little f. Now let me let me do something in in a different color than I'm about to erase. Normally I would we would have written this little f of x dx. That's how we that's the notation we were using from last time. And this is good except for one thing. If I have x as a limit of integration and as a variable that I'm integrating with respect to, it's very confusing. So now part of this creating this new area accumulation function Part of the complication, although this is a really slight one, is to say, wait, I now want to use the variable x to tell you where to stop integrating. So I'm going to get rid of all this blue stuff 
and rename the old function's variable. I'll just name it something like t, and this will be dt. So for example, maybe I could do like a visual example. Let's say f, normally I would say f of little x, maybe it's like the absolute value of x. We'll make it visual in a second. But if I'm going to create the area accumulation function of little f, okay, I'm going to want to get in the habit of saying, well, let's call its variable t. And let me draw a picture of this graph. It's not too hard to do. So now that's usually the x-axis. I'm going to say, well, that's a t-axis. And what I really have here is my absolute value graph, the absolute value of t. Okay, so I might start with a function like that, and then I might say, let's make an area accumulation function. I'll write this guy in red. Capital F of X will say, add up the area from a starting point. Maybe I'll pick negative one as my starting point. And you're gonna stop where I tell you to stop, X of the absolute value of T. So this would be, of my function f of t, which is just the absolute value of t. So the notation gets a little annoying, but it, that's not that takes a little bit of practice to get used to. What's really going on is how weird it is to compute the outputs of capital F. So let's try that with this example. Let's say, okay, what is capital F of the number one? Well, visually, what this means is, uh, well, I guess before I do visually, I'll say, okay, well, this says add up the signed area from negative one. Oh, and now you've told me where to stop. Stop at the number one. So add up the signed area from negative one to one of my little f function, the absolute value of t. And so what is this really saying? This is saying if this is, um, if over here, is t equals negative 1, then capital F of 1 is the output that equals all of this green signed area. That's what F of 1 equals all of this area. So these two areas added. What does, um, let's see, what does f of 0 equal? Well, that would be the definite integral from negative 1 to stop at 0 of the absolute value of t. And this would represent, this could be represented by this orange area, that might be f of zero, right? So as you change the x input into this capital area function, you change where the area stops being added. And so you could get different amounts of signed area. This is what this function is doing. It's keeping track of the signed area under this little f function. So let's try another example. Here's example one. It says, suppose f, they didn't give us a formula, they just gave us a visual thing, is the function whose graph is shown below. So this is y equals f. And again, normally I like to think of my variables when I have pictures, I like to think of this horizontal axis as the x-axis but I'm going to use x as a place to stop integrating now. So I'm going to call this t. I'm going to call the input for my starting function t. And they say, okay, for this example, this capital F function, this area accumulation function, keeps track of the area, and I should say the signed area, um, of this function, little f, starting at zero. 
And so when they say, hey, what is capital F of 5? This is the signed area. I keep wanting to say area. The signed area um, of or under F from 0 to 5. That is, it is the definite integral from 0 to 5 of this function. And if we wanted to do this with formulas, oh my gosh, we would then say, well, let's approximate this with a bunch of rectangles and then try and take a limit of all that rectangle area. Instead, we want to interpret this as area or signed area, because if I look at the picture for f of t, I can actually use old area formulas to compute this area. right? So the way it's kind of natural for this picture to break this up into two areas, maybe from 0 to 3, plus, and then I'm going to say, oh, and then the leftover area from 3 to 5. And the only reason I'm breaking that up is so that I can more meaningfully color code this. right? The area from 0 to 3 is going to be a positive signed area, and the area from 3 to 5 is going to be some negative signed area, right? because it's below the x-axis. So this first area, how on earth am I going to compute this area? Well, it's not too bad because it's made up of triangles and squares. Um, and if you really think about this area, I see one square, two square. There's two. And then I've got to use my formula for the area of, of this triangle and the area of this triangle. But once you add it all together, you should get the, the area is four. And then for this red area down here, similarly, if you add up the area you see, you see really two triangles. There's one, and there's the other one, which maybe I'll put there. The area there is going to equal two. So what is F of capital F of five? It's the green signed area. That's positive four. Plus the red signed area, so that should be a negative 2. And so what I should get here is just 2. So this is, I have to admit, this is a weird thing to do to a function, right? We are, we are starting with this function little f, and we are forming this area accumulation function, capital F. A natural question to ask is why would anybody do this? And it turns out there's two answers. One is less satisfying than the other, but they're both honest. The um, maybe more satisfying answer is you would do this simply because it gives you a way of creating new functions from old ones. If you think about ways that we have of creating new functions, we might take a function and add it within the old one, or we might multiply it with an old one, or we might compose it. And now when we have this area process introduced, we can create a new function by keeping track of the area of the old function. Turns out to just be something new we can do. The second answer, the second reason we do this is because once we introduce these quote unquote area accumulation functions, once we introduce these, it turns out they might be weird functions to actually compute their outputs of. Like in example one, I was able to compute the outputs because the starting function, little f, was so nice. But if little f was really ugly, then the area function's outputs will be very hard to approximate using rectangles. So the area accumulation function is hard to compute with. But, and here's finally the second reason, it's derivative. The derivative of an area accumulation function turns out to be super easy. You don't have to do anything. And this is what the fundamental theorem of calculus part one is saying. So let's scroll down. Here's, here's where our notes say it. I'm going to sort of highlight the most important part. So first off, the name, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we can say, okay, this is part one. Here's what it's saying. 
if you form an area accumulation function f of x and if you take its derivative the derivative looks weird right we're taking an x derivative and x is stopping an integral of another function but if you do that the derivative is just the original function I'm going to say this even shorter, right? The derivative of an area function is the original function. So I may not know how to compute. I may not know how to compute the outputs of capital F, but I sure know its rate of change. Okay, so um, before we do example two, we'll go back and do example two. Let me do my own example that I think maybe works works a little bit better. Um, let's actually, so let's just call this example, I don't know, 1.5 between example one and two. Um, so let's try little f is the function, and maybe I'll use an x for its variable first, is just the function, um, oh, let's try the function, let's try a constant, 3. And so what I'd like to create is capital f of x, and this is going to be the area under little f from a starting point, um, from A to the stopping point X. And so as soon as I want to form an area accumulation function, this tells me I should rewrite this function not using the variable X. I should rewrite it using the variable T, just makes it easier to notate things. So this is way better for right now. And so let's say my area accumulation function, capital F of X, says, okay, we're going to start integrating from some starting point. I haven't even said it. Maybe it's zero, maybe it's negative one, who knows? Um, but at some point A, and we'll stop at the point X. And now what we're going to integrate up is all the area of little f. So let's actually see what this is. If I use the constant function three, I'm just talking about the signed area that's under this flat line function, y equals three. And so we can really think about this. Wait, if you're telling me I'm gonna start at a number a and end at some stopping point x, then um, how, much, how much area positive or negative area am I going to get here? Right? How much is this? Well, for a constant function like 3, this area, and I should say signed area, this signed area is just the height 3 times the width a minus x. Right, so because capital F of X is keeping track of an area, and this area is really easy to see, this formula, capital F of X, is just 3 times, oh, I said A minus X, I'm sorry. Look at that, I did that backward. X minus A. That's just 3 times X minus A. And so here's what the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 is saying. Take a derivative of that area, do a d by dx of that formula, and if you want to write it out in terms of integrals, well, we can. That's a d by dx of this. But what is this going to be? Well, that's just taking an x derivative of, in this case, 3 times x minus a. Now, you might be a little surprised by that a, but a is just some constant, right? 
it could be zero or negative one, it's wherever I'm starting the area. So when I take an x derivative of a constant, I'm going to get zero. And so what's the x derivative of three times x? Well, that's just three. So, so let's keep track of where this example story led. It started with, I'm going to look at the function f of t is the constant 3. I formed this area accumulation function, and the derivative of the area accumulation function was my original little f. The fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 says this happens no matter how ugly little f is. In this case, little f is easy, but let's try one more example. We'll call this example 1.75. We'll deal with a slightly uglier f of t function. So let's start with little f, and again I'll call this variable t, is just the function x. So there's, oh sorry, I said it's the function x, but I want to call this variable t. So it's the function t. So this is y equals t. And let's form the area accumulation function, capital F of x. We'll start our area under little f. We'll start it at, let's say, 0, and we'll stop at x. So this will be the integral from 0 to x of t dt. So like for this one, like we did in my previous example, we can actually compute a few values of this area. f, capital F of 0 is 0, because there's no area over a point. Capital F of 1, if you really think about it, should be the area from 0 to 1. So maybe it's this. And so that's a triangle. I know a formula for the area of a triangle. That's 1 half base times height. So this should just be 1 half 1 times 1. OK, but what the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 is saying, whenever you do this, whenever you create an area accumulation function, its derivative is really easy to compute. So let's see what the, um, what the derivative of this capital F of x function is going to be. And again, because my original F of t function wasn't too bad, I will be able to figure out what capital F of x is without using integrals. All right, so let's think about what capital F of x is. In general, capital F of x is the area starting at 0 and stopping not necessarily at 1, but maybe stopping at x. So now I don't know exactly what that is, but capital F says what's that area? All right, so we can actually write this out because this is just a triangle. F of x equals, it's technically the signed area, of this triangle, and that's one half base times height. And let's think about this. So that's one half. Well, what's the base of this picture? It's just the value of x. And what's the height? Well, what's the y value there? That's the line y equals t, so that's at the point t equals x, comma y equals x. So the height there is also x. So the area of that red triangle is just x squared over 2. And now here's what I'm going to ask you. OK, for this question, the area accumulation function, we can write down without integrals, which means we can differentiate it, right? Ignore where this capital F function came from. What's its derivative? Hopefully we all agree the derivative is x. But wait a minute, we've seen that function before. That is the same thing as little f. That's the same thing, right? Except it's not little f of t. The t's went away. We integrated them all away. But it's little f of x. This is what the fundamental theorem of calculus is always saying, part one. The fundamental theorem of calculus, part one,
says the following. Again, I'm going to repeat it because if being home trying to avoid or limit the spread of corona is good for one thing, it's repeating. The fundamental theorem of calculus part one says the following. If you create an area accumulation function that starts at some place and always ends at your variable x, then this function's derivative is super duper easy to figure out. You just take this integrand and write it, but put an x now back for its variable. So let's do a quick popper on this, because this gives us a way of asking um, really hard questions that, sorry, really hard looking questions that are actually really easy. So look, I'll give you an example. Suppose I tell you, hey, take the x derivative of the following terrible mass. Oh, sorry, I put x's in there. I didn't mean to. Okay. Okay, so I want to point something out. There's two things going on that are really complicated. Actually, sorry, three things that are going on that's really complicated before I even give you answer choices. Thing number one is that this function, this integrand, is ugly. I picked a deliberately ugly, nasty function. It's supposed to be ugly. You're not supposed to look at that and understand it. That's a mess. The second thing that I think is important to acknowledge is now, not only am I giving you a terrible, ugly function, but now I'm talking about adding up its area. So how on earth can we think about adding up the area of an ugly function? That's like some terrible, ugly limit of rectangle stuff. And then the third thing we're doing, dear God, is asking you to say, wait a minute, not only am I asking you to add up the area of this ugly mess, I'm telling you stop the, stop the adding area at a variable place and now take a derivative changing where you stop the area. There's three things going on here. We're computing a variable area of an ugly function and asking us to compute the rate of change of that area. That, if you think about it that way, if you think about what this is saying, all the parts it involves, it's really, really ugly. But if you think about this in terms of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, the answer should be really easy. It should just be the derivative is just whatever function you were integrating, but make sure you write its variables using the variable name x. So this is the answer. Now, let me show you some common wrong answers. It would be natural to say, oh, maybe I just write down this. And this expression is wrong, but not for a deep reason. This is wrong because we forgot to put all of our variables back in the language of x. And just think about why this is wrong. Whatever this stuff is in this terrible integrand thing, look at this part, d by dx. We're assuming we have a function of x. And so if you tell me the x derivative involves t's, it kind of sounds like you're crazy. So the variable t actually does have a good name. I really like it. It's called a dummy variable, right? He appears in the integrate in the integrand, and he's the variable of integration. But if we could compute this area formula, it would depend only on x, not on t. And so then, when we take a derivative of that x stuff, right, then we would only get an expression involving x. Okay, so that's why B in this popper would be a wrong choice. Here's another thing. Um, student might take this integrand and actually try to differentiate it, right? So someone might say, oh, the answer is going to be like the derivative of 1 plus x squared plus x fourth all square rooted times cosine of x plus the square root of that stuff times the derivative of cosine of x. You can see how someone might make that mistake, thinking that I need to differentiate that inside stuff.
The fundamental theorem of calculus is saying something much deeper, and it makes it much easier to use. No matter what terrible thing you're integrating, the derivative of the area accumulation function is that thing with x's. And we saw two examples, or I tried to work out two examples, to show you that this happens, at least in easy cases. The fundamental theorem of calculus is very powerful, because it happens even if I don't know how to write out this integral without using integral signs. Okay, so let's move on um, to what our notes say is the next example. Oh, sorry, I think I skipped something our notes wanted to say. Here we go. Now we're going to example two. And it says, let f be a continuous function satisfying x cubed plus x squared minus x equals this stuff over here. And now we want to say, what is capital F of x? Well, for example two, it would be correct to say that capital F of x, we have two expressions for it, right? The first thing is, it is the area starting at one and ending at the variable x under little f's graph. They also told us, they happen to tell us, hey, for whatever function little f is, we worked it out somehow and got that this answer is x cubed plus x squared minus x. So which of these is the right answer? They're both right. On the one hand, they're saying capital F is the area starting at one and ending at x. And we can say that's a definite integral. But then they told us for this question, it happens to have this nice formula. Okay, so what is the derivative of capital F? Well, by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, it equals this thing, the integrand, with an x. But then by using just regular calculus, we can x differentiate this, and we would get 3x squared plus 2x minus 1. And then for part c, they say, okay, what's the second derivative? Well, that would be, I'm going to take a derivative of this, so that would be the first derivative of little f, and then I just take another derivative of this, and I would get 6x plus 2. Okay, so let's try another example that they have for us. Example three, find f prime of x, where we're talking about capital F, given that capital F is this mess. And let's make this our second popper question. So this will be popper question two. What is the answer to this thing? Is it A, um, the derivative is t squared plus 2t is the answer b is the derivative 2t plus 2 is it c is it 2x plus 2 or is it d x squared oh sorry let me rewrite this i forgot i wanted to change colors here is it d x squared plus 2x, or is it e, none of the above? So this is proper question two, what answer is this? And again, I want to point something out. I know I'm probably beating, um, I don't know, I'm probably, what's that saying? I'm probably beating a dead uh, horse, sorry, um, but I do want to repeat this. Right now, if I asked you for the output f of 6, capital F of 6, you would have to go to 0 to 6, t squared plus 2t, and you would need to find a limit of rectangles to give you this number. But that's not what we're asking for here. We're acknowledging the outputs of this area function are hard to compute. So what? Tell me the derivative of this area function. And the fundamental theorem of calculus might just confirm a way to absolutely get the right answer here. Okay.
So let's try example four. It's the same thing. Um, I just want to point out here, you might want to name some things, right? Here, I might say that little f, usually we would say little f of t. Well, they're being a little jerky in here. They're saying, oh, I'm using the dummy variable s. Little f of s is five cosine of two s. It's the guy being integrated. And so capital F of x is the integral of that little function. And so now by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, we have that the derivative of this is just the integrand, but we're going to replace its dummy variable with our variable x. So the derivative of this guy is just 5 times the cosine, not of 2s, but of 2x. And so now they said, well, what's f prime of 4 pi? This will now be 5 times the cosine of 8 pi, which should just be 5. All right. Example five, they sort of spoil some stuff with this, but whatever. Example five, let's just focus on what they're asking. Again, says, hey, we want you, we're forming a function, square root of 3t plus 1. We're going to integrate it from somewhere to somewhere. And then we're going to take a derivative of that integrating process. So whenever you see a derivative in front of an integral sign, oh my god, you should be thinking the fundamental theorem of calculus. The first thing we should note, though, is that this integral looks a little wrong because we have the variable that we're used to seeing as the upper limit appearing as a lower limit. If you go and scroll back up, pause the video and then rewind it, um, you'll see that we had the variable of integration, sorry, the variable uh, where we're stopping the integration, right, that's appearing as an upper limit. Now they're saying, oh, put it as a lower limit. Always stop the area at zero, but start it at who knows. If you want to keep things written the way we introduce them, say, well, I don't care about that. I can switch the limits of integration. That's not a problem. But as they reminded us from section 6.1, whenever you flip the limits of integration, you get a negative sign. And so now, if you want, um, I can say something like this. I can say, oh, let's put that negative sign inside if you want. Negative square root 3t plus 1, all dt. And so now I can say, okay, the integrand, the thing being integrated, is little function, little f of t, capital f of x, is now the integral that starts at zero and ends at x of f of t dt. And so by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, we have that capital F prime of x is just little f of x. So that would be negative square root of three x plus one. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'm impressed that our notes mention this here. Suppose that we're forming an area accumulation function where the upper limit isn't just x, but it's some function of x. And they called it v of x. So let's try this one here. I actually don't like uh, example six. I don't like that they called it capital F, but that's okay. So I'm going to rewrite this as this is an integral that starts at pi, and it doesn't end at x, it ends at some v of x. And then I have my integrand, little f of t is 1 over 1 plus t squared dt. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, let me, in blue, suppose we had defined capital G of X to be the regular area accumulation function that starts at pi and ends at X. 
of the same little f of t. If this were the question, then the fundamental theorem of calculus would tell us, oh, the derivative of capital G, you write down your integrand and you get this. Of course, that's not what we're given here. If you think about our function f of x, though, that is the same thing as a composition. It's g of v of x. Right? If I plug into g, don't stop at x, but stop at v of x. Don't stop at x, stop at v of x. Then I get the function they gave me. And so now I know how to differentiate this by using the chain rule. And so let's think about what this is. Well, hopefully you just agreed with me that the derivative of g is 1 over 1 plus its input squared. So g prime of v of x should be 1 over 1 plus v of x squared. And then v, of course, in this problem is the function 5x squared. And so its derivative would be 10x. So this becomes a 10x. And so let me go ahead and plug in v of x. I'll erase that little input was 5x squared. So really, I just use the fundamental theorem of calculus um, uh, uh, to get this guy's derivative, right? f prime of x is 1 over 1 plus 25 x to the fourth all times 10x. All right, here, example 7, right? They kind of want us to do the same thing, but what we can do here is break this up into two um, integrals. Uh, let's see if I can maybe white this out. Okay, cool. See if this works. So I really want to break this up into two integrals. Maybe I go from x squared and I'll stop somewhere, I don't know, zero, to t squared dt, plus integral from zero to 2x cubed um, t squared dt. And then I'll write that again. That first integral I kind of like, except it's got the variable as the starting one. So at the cost of introducing a minus sign, I can flip those limits of integration. Okay, so let's think about this. What I really have is f of x equals two different area accumulation functions. The first one is the integral from 0 to x squared of negative t squared dt, and then plus, and the second one is the integral from 0 to 2x cubed t squared dt. So of course to differentiate this with respect to x, I'm going to differentiate each piece with respect to x. And so to do this with respect to x, I am going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus and I'm going to use the chain rule. How is this going to work? Well, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells me that this guy should just be little f of where I stop. So little f of x squared. And little f in that case is negative t squared. So this should be negative where I stop squared. So it's negative t squared. But now I'm plugging in where I stop. But then times the derivative of my stopping function. So that would be 2x. And then plus, and then for the green piece, I'm also going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus.
and a chain rule. And so what am I going to get? I'm going to get, again, this integrand evaluated where I stop. So that's going to be where I stop all squared times the derivative of where I stop. That'll be 6x. So that's how we combine the chain rule to handle expressions, um, integrals of functions whose stopping and starting places depend on x. And for this one, I can actually simplify some of this stuff. That's negative x to the fourth times 2x. That's negative 2x to the fifth. And then the next one is plus 12x to the sixth. Okay, so let me scroll back up for a second before we finish up these notes on the second part of the fundamental theorem. Let me scroll back up to where we first started talking about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Here's one place. There's one condition that you'll notice stated in our notes that I've ignored. So there's a lot going on in this statement, first off. Again, we are adding up the area of some ugly function and we're changing, we're stopping where we add up the area depending on an input. The derivative of this process is super easy to compute. It's just the function we were, whose area we were adding up. There's only one condition that we want to follow for this. We want to make sure that the function whose area we're adding, that it's continuous. Turns out we can relax this a little bit, but generally speaking, we'd like this function to not jump around. Okay, so maybe I should pause and do like a third popper question. Popper question three. Uh, compute the second derivative of this particular weird area accumulation function, maybe it stops at x cubed, of e to the t dt. Oh, sorry. I was writing faster than I was speaking. Compute f double prime of x where f of x equals this. All right. So is the correct answer e to the x cubed um, is the correct answer e to the x cubed all times 3x squared. Oh, sorry. I think I just realized something. I said second derivative. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I meant first derivative. Okay is the answer um, e to the t is the answer e to the 3x squared or is it none of the above okay so i am going to power through these and get to the fundamental theorem of calculus part two it's the second part um, and it involves this new word, so I'll actually introduce my own, um, my own notes here. It involves this new term that we call an antiderivative. And you can kind of guess what this means. So, <laughs> if, uh, Uh, antiderivative. If I give you a function, say little f of x, yeah, and I say, oh, that's x squared plus x, and I say, hey, what's the first derivative? Well, you could compute that. That's 2x plus 1. And then I could say, well, what's the second derivative? All right, and you say, okay, that's not too bad. That's just 2. And then I could even ask, well, what's the third derivative? Oh, gosh, that's zero. And if you think about it, all the derivatives after 
for this function stay zero. So this was, if I sort of look at this chain of information, I say, oh, look, I took one derivative, so one derivative, and I got this, and then I took two derivatives, and I got this, and then I took three derivatives, and I got this. But there's something I could say, so I could now sort of use this, we could have done this a long time ago, I could say, wait, what's a negative one derivative? What's something that would appear above this f of x in this list? Right? If you just look at the right-hand side of these equal signs, everything on the right-hand side is the derivative of the thing below it. So what would be the negative one derivative? That would be undoing a derivative. Can you think of a function whose derivative is x? Sure, you might guess x squared, but if you take a derivative of x squared, you'll get 2x, so you better divide by 2. Can you think of a function whose derivative is x squared? And you say, well, if it's x cubed, that when I take a derivative, it'll go down. So this will be x cubed over 3. And so this guy right here, you really could call something like this the or a negative 1 derivative of little f. You really could. But we call this an antiderivative. An antiderivative for a function f of x is a new function. And here's what it's defined to be. Its derivative is your old function. All right, so let me write that down. An antiderivative for a function little f of x is a new function, and for maybe for right this second, I'll call it little g of x, that satisfies g prime of x equals the function you started with. You can think of this as a negative one derivative. It's the function that comes before in this list of derivatives. And one thing that's important to note, so maybe I'll switch colors to note this, there are lots of antiderivatives for a single function. So let me go back to my example. I said f of x was, what was it? x squared plus uh, x. And here's one antiderivative. We wrote it x cubed over 3 plus x squared over 2. If you take a derivative of this thing, you will get back to this guy. So that means this guy is an antiderivative. But look, here is a different function that is also an antiderivative. x cubed over 3 plus x squared over 2 plus 1,000, right? If I also take a derivative of this orange guy, I get back to f of x. And so we just want to make the quick comment, it's easy to understand why, that for a single function, it has lots of antiderivatives, at least as many constants as there are that you can add on. And so, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 2, says the following. Well, actually, before we get to Part 2, let's do a second note. The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 1, really says the following. Area accumulation functions are antiderivatives. If you really think about what this means, you have to remember what do I mean by area accumulation? What do I mean by antiderivative? Well, what I mean by area accumulation is it's a signed area stopping at x of a function little f. And what did the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 tell us? When I take a derivative of this, I get little f back. That's being an antiderivative.
So the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, we could phrase in terms of this word antiderivative. Turns out the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, we can also phrase in terms of antiderivatives. And here's what it says. I'll actually read along with you the text. It says, suppose as before, we start with a reasonable function, somebody that's continuous over now, it's not a variable interval, right? The interval starts at a number and stops at a number. And it says, hey, suppose you're lucky enough to find any antiderivative of little f, we'll call it capital G. Then the definite integral is just the difference at b and at a of the antiderivatives values. This is magic. What this says is that you don't need rectangles. You don't need to think about delta x chops. You don't need to think about letting n go to infinity. You don't need to think about any of this stuff to compute the actual signed area under a curvy graph. Find an antiderivative, any antiderivative, and subtract its values at the endpoints. Okay, so this is why, it's the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2. This is why students who stop calculus think integrating equals anti-differentiating. Because this gives us such a shorter way to compute um, definite integrals. But I just want to clarify, integrating is not anti-differentiating. Integrating is computing signed area. And there's a theorem that says, here's a shorter way to do it. So let's try this with example nine. Example nine says, use the fundamental theorem of calculus to compute the definite integral from one to five of the function two x dx. So here's what we say. We say, okay, I can either do this by setting up a bunch of rectangle areas and trying to take a complicated limit of that, or I can find an antiderivative. And what am I looking for? My antiderivative for, I'll just go ahead and call the integrand little f for 2x. So here's where I need to think carefully. What is a function whose derivative will turn into 2x? One that I can write down. And if you really think carefully about this process, right, about answering that question, you're really thinking about how do I undo a derivative rule that landed me at 2x? And it's not too hard to say, oh, here is one antiderivative. Here is a function that when I take a derivative, I remember taking a derivative of this, x squared produces 2x. And your friend might say, oh, I thought of a different antiderivative. Maybe they thought of x squared plus 13. And maybe one of your other friends thought of x squared minus pi. So it turns out the fundamental theorem of calculus part two says it doesn't matter which of these you use, you will get the same answer, right? So this says, once we have picked one of these antiderivatives to use, this definite integral will be capital G of five minus capital G of two. This, some, so capital G is the function x squared so this is another way I like to notate this, that we're plugging in five and two and subtracting. You write maybe these brackets with a five up here and a two down there. In our textbook and other places, instead of the brackets, they might use a giant line. But all that is to say the same thing. We're plugging in the upper number, upper limit of integration. Then we're plugging in the lower limit of integration. Oops, sorry. And we're gonna subtract. When I do that, I'll get 25 minus 4, that's 21. The actual area under 2x from 1 to 5 is 21. And I know this video is already long, but let me contrast that with the visual way of doing it. So we have the function 
oops, sorry, it should be steeper. We have the function 2x. And we're going from maybe 2 to 5. So we want this area under this triangular graph. That's what we're after. Right, and it's kind of a, a trapezoidy area, but you can actually figure this out. Right, so the area of this trying of this triangular shape, this trapezoid shape, that is the integral from two to five of two x dx. Okay, but we can do this using old formulas, right? I see this triangle here, and I see this rectangle thing down there. So this guy, this has height four and width three. So that's 12. Why did it have height 4? Because that was the point 2 comma 2x. And this point up here will be 5 comma 10. So now for this part, let's figure out that's going to be 1 half. Um, base is 3. And the height isn't 10, right? The height is 10 minus 4. That's the height of this rectangle, 10 minus, uh, sorry, the height of that triangle, 10 minus four. So that's going to be three over two times six, which is equal to nine. And so the area of this thing is just 12 plus nine, which is 21. That is exactly what we got by appealing to an antiderivative. Another question you might have is, Okay, if I'm going to do this problem the antiderivative way, what would have happened had I used one of these other antiderivatives? I'll focus on x squared plus 13. Well, imagine you would use that down below. So you'd have an x squared plus 13, and an x squared plus 13, and I might put parentheses. If I had done that, when I plug in 5, I would get 5 squared plus 13 minus... 2 squared plus 13. So what would have happened? I would have gotten 5 squared plus 13 minus 2 squared minus 13. This silly constant that I could have used would have canceled, and it would have been the exact same number, 21. So this is why using any of your antiderivatives doesn't make a difference. Okay, let's try maybe another example. This one says, let's look at, um, uh, let's try this try one, yeah? Um, and let me hide up, I mean, you can see it, but it just takes up valuable writing space. It says, okay, let capital F be defined by capital F of X is the integral from a starting place to stopping at X of some other function. Right away, there's two things I want you to know. Right away, whenever somebody defines a function using a capital letter. Not always, this isn't always true, but often that's a sign they're defining something as the integral of something else. Not always, but often. Second thing, whenever somebody defines um, a function to be an area accumulation function, that is the integral of another guy, what that's telling you is I don't necessarily know how to compute f of x, F, capital F of X, may be hard, but by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, F prime of X is super easy. It's just my integrand with X's. So let's try this one. We have capital F of X is this particular um, uh, area accumulation function, and it says find the critical numbers for capital F. Well, critical numbers, that's where its derivative is zero, or doesn't exist. This guy's derivative will exist everywhere. And the derivative of this guy is super easy to compute by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So I like to acknowledge these with FTCs. And my integrand here is t squared minus 4t cubed. It's really natural to make the mistake I just made. In fact, you know, it barely even counts as a 
a mistake. Uh, but really, I should change the T's to X's. And so in here, I can actually factor out an X squared, and I'll get 1 minus 4X. So I want to know where is F prime, capital F prime equal to 0. I want to know where is that 0. And so I say, oh, X could equal 0. Or this piece could be 0, which would mean X would equal 1 fourth. So I found two critical numbers for capital F. Really, this isn't a question about critical numbers. This is a question about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Part B says, tell me the concavity of this area accumulation function. Well, concavity relates to the second derivative. So that should be the derivative of the first derivative. That is, that's the derivative of um, x squared minus 4x cubed. And we know how to differentiate that. That's 2x minus 12x squared. So to talk about the concavity, we want to know where is the second derivative positive or negative. So let's find out where it's neither. So maybe I can factor out a 2x. And I'll have 1 minus 6x. And so let's set that equal to 0. And we'll say, well, x equals 0 makes the second derivative 0. And x equals 1 6. So I might do like a number line sign diagram for the second derivative here. I've got x equals 0, x equals 1 6. And now I just want to plug in things around it into the second derivative, so into this thing. So if x is less than 0, then everything I'm going to get out of that formula I underlined is negative. If I pick a number between 0 and 1 6, I don't know, maybe like 1 tenth. Might be annoying to compute that out, but it turns out I'm going to get a positive number. If I pick a number bigger than 1 6, oh, like 10, it's not too hard to see that this will be negative. So what did we learn? F is concave up on the interval from 0 to 1 6, and it's concave down on these two separate intervals, from negative infinity to 0, and then from 1 6 to infinity. And what is that telling us about this original function? This original function, it's saying, hey, when is the area increasing or decreasing in a way that's bent up? Well, that's when this thing is concave up. So that would be here. When is this area changing in a way that's bent down? That would be on this interval of stopping values in this interval. OK, so let me throw in um, the last bit of popper questions for this video. Sorry to scroll around so much. I'm going to see what popper question we stopped on. I think it was two. Maybe it was three. It was three. OK, so let's do one more real popper question and then a kind of fake one. So popper question four. Um, would be something like this. Let's now compute the signed area under the graph of, oh, let's do sine of x um, from 0 to pi over 2. And so let me draw a picture of this area that I actually want you to tell me. I don't want you to set up rectangles and, and approximate it. I actually want to know the real area, the number you get. So sine of x starts at 0, and at pi over 2, it's up at 1. So it's going to look like this. And if I were to keep drawing the sine graph, it would keep going like that. But all I want is for you to start here and stop there. And I just want you to take a moment um, to compute this area. That's what I want. Now again, if you just go to our previous video, it's broken up into two long parts, but in our previous video, we talked, I, ta I talked a long time 
um, about setting this up as a limit of rectangle areas. And now, if we use the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, maybe we can do this a little bit easier, right? This area, this signed area, is supposed to equal the interval from zero to pi of, sorry, pi over two um, of sine of x. And that's all dx. That's what this area is supposed to equal. So the fundamental theorem of calculus part two says, hey, can you think of a function that's an antiderivative for sine? Can you think of a function um, that uh, when you take a derivative of it, you get sine? So for your antiderivatives, you might think, oh, maybe cosine. But when you take a derivative of that, you don't get sine, you get the wrong thing. You get negative sine. So maybe a good antiderivative would be negative cosine of x. So the fundamental theorem of calculus part two says, don't do this using rectangles. Find an antiderivative and then plug in the endpoints. So now this popper question is asking you, what do you get when you plug in the endpoints into your antiderivative? Do you get the answer choice A? Do you get one? Do you get the answer choice B? Do you get negative one? Do you get the answer choice C? Maybe it all cancels out, you get zero. Maybe you get like a weird sine number, like the square root of two over two. Okay, so 6.3 picks up with this sort of question. That's where we start practicing finding antiderivatives for familiar functions. All right, so let's just end with five proper questions. Proper question five, the answer choice will be D. All right, guys, just a couple more sections and then we're all done. I hope you're doing well. By the way, if you were paying careful attention for the video notes for, what was it, section 6.2 this whole time, all the stuff before, you may have noticed some audio interruptions, and that was my son's toy, which is a fart blaster. You're welcome.